I'm about to introduce you to a place where the laws of physics take a vacation. Welcome to the mystery spot where you can witness all kinds of implausible things that will leave you scratching your head in disbelief. Don't worry, it's not sorcery or witchcraft. It's just some clever optical illusions that mess with your brain and make you question reality. Back in the day when the Great Depression was hitting hard, people needed some fun distractions. That's how the entertainment industry gave birth to the concept of mystery spots. One of the most famous mystery spots is the one near Santa Cruz, California. The name is all intrigue and mystique, isn't it? Once you step inside, you'll see people standing upright on a slanted floor or at impossible angles on a flat surface. You'll see a ball rolling up a ramp defying gravity and logic. It's like being in a fun house but without creepy clowns. The site is known for its gravity-defying demonstrations, which appear to bend the laws of physics, both on the short uphill walk and inside the wooden building on the site. Misperceptions of the height and orientation of objects occur here. These visual illusions include balls rolling uphill and people leaning farther than normally possible without falling down. Psychologists at Berkeley state that all of the misperceptions stem from the simple fact that the house is slanted at a 20 degree angle. The next stop is again in the USA, but this time at Hoover Dam in Nevada. Here gravity seems to play with us too. Try this experiment if you ever happen to go there. Pour water from a bottle over the dam. You will witness that instead of going down, the water will start flowing upward. The reason behind this is a very powerful updraft that the structure of the dam creates. In other words, the water gets carried upward by the wind. This trick is not unique to the dam, as there's a reverse waterfall in the Faroe Islands. It occurs due to a wild weather phenomenon known as an inverted waterfall. Imagine a gigantic whirlwind of ocean spray swirling up a steep, 1,542 foot high rocky cliff. So how does this crazy phenomenon happen, you ask? Well, it's all thanks to a spiral column of air that rotates near high and steep cliffs, creating a mini tornado effect. And when the wind hits the edge of the cliff, it gets even stronger and picks up coastal water, which then splashes up the cliff and creates a massive water and wind funnel. Apparently, these inverted waterfalls can happen in other places too, like on the cliffs of Mohair in Ireland, the mountains of Iceland, and even in the Waipuhia Falls of Hawaii. Talk about Mother Nature showing off her skills. Ah, Magnetic Hill in Lodak, India? The ultimate mind-bending road trip destination? Here, you can watch objects and cars roll uphill like they're stuck in some kind of magnetic vortex. It's an optical illusion that occurs thanks to the sneaky slopes and general layout of the area. The road might look like it's going uphill, but it's actually a downhill road in disguise, playing tricks on your brain like a mischievous magician. You might also see your car moving by itself in the neutral gear. No, your car isn't haunted. It's just basic physics at work. Even when the engine is off, the wheels can still turn, thanks to momentum and the subtle slope of the road. Mount Aragats has a similar story to the Magnetic Hill of India. This one, too, is like a magnet for thrill-seekers and car enthusiasts. It's located on the border between Turkey and Armenia. It has a reputation for making cars defy gravity. People from all over the world visit this mountain to witness the incredible spectacle, where a car parked on the slope seems to roll uphill all by itself without any driver behind the wheel. There's a nearby river that flows uphill too. People who visited this site claim that it's easier to go up than down there. Number six on the list is the Golden Boulder from Myanmar. The rock looks like it's about to tumble down the hill at any moment, but it's not going anywhere. It's been sitting there for over 2,500 years. The rock is the centerpiece of a stunning pagoda that sits on top of it, towering 49 feet above the ground. According to legend, the rock is held in place by none other than a strand of Buddha's hair. It's no wonder that this place is one of the most important Buddhist pilgrimage sites in Myanmar. The rock was chosen by a celestial king who was impressed by a Buddhist monk's incredible asceticism. So, he used his supernatural powers to carefully place the rock in its current spot, where it looked like the monk's head. If that's not enough, it's said that only a woman can move the boulder. That's why women aren't allowed to touch it. So, if you're up for an adventure, head over to this magnificent rock and pagoda and witness this gravity-defying feat for yourself. Back to the U.S. Oregon Vortex is located on Sardine Creek, Oregon. It's a tourist attraction that's been around since 1930. 
The owners of the attraction claim that it's some paranormal activity, but it's pretty obvious some clever optical illusions are involved. Legend has it that even before the attraction was built, Native Americans in the area warned that this land was forbidden and horses refused to go there. But then, some gold miners built an assay office there in 1904, and the building ended up sliding to a wonky angle. Now picture this. You're in a cozy spot, away from city light pollution, staring up at billions of stars putting on a sparkling show above you. But if you're lucky enough to be in Marfa, Texas, you'll get a little something extra. Mysterious orbs decide to join in on the fun, shining bright like a diamond, and they've been doing it for over a hundred years. But what are these glowing orbs called Marfa lights? Well, everyone has their own theories. Some people think they're just car lights from the nearby highway, but that's no fun. Others believe that these orbs are actually sentient beings trying to convey some sort of important message to us. Mere mortals. Imagine standing at the edge of a stunning lake, admiring the picturesque view of a majestic volcano. Suddenly, you hear a loud boom and flames shoot up into the air like a firework show gone wild. But don't worry, it's not an eruption. It's just the Kauaijin Lake and volcano doing its thing. This fiery spectacle is caused by a natural phenomenon where sulfuric gases burst through the rocks and ignite upon contact with the outside air. The result? Flames that soar up to 16 feet in height, burning blue like the coolest neon lights you've ever seen. And if that's not enough, the liquid sulfur that streams down the mountain looks like a molten river of electric blue lava. It's equal parts terrifying and breathtaking, and a sight you won't soon forget. Speaking of unforgettable things, the Rachat structure in Mauritania has been an eye-catching enigma for astronauts since the dawn of the NASA space program. This circular feature in Earth's crust was created by a raised dome that was eroded over time, revealing the original flat rock layers. As you move from the center of the structure outward, you travel back in time, as the older rock layers are exposed in the middle. This geological phenomenon is made up of sedimentary and igneous rocks and measures 28 miles across. From space, you can see several faults where the rock layers have shifted and have been pulled apart. The Rachat structure is situated in the heart of the Sahara Desert. There you go. This is our version of the top 10. Would you add something else to this list? You might not think about gravity much, but it affects everything we do. It's the reason why things fall down instead of flying up. It keeps us connected to the Earth, so we don't float away into space when we jump. But for physicists, gravity is something more. It's a fascinating puzzle that needs to be solved to understand how the universe works, and they're on a quest to uncover its secrets. So what's so mysterious about it? Let's see. We've learned a lot about gravity from the legendary Isaac Newton. He was the first to invent the law of gravitation. He taught us that any two objects in the universe can't help but be attracted to each other. It's like they have this secret gravitational crush going on. How strong this attraction is depends on two things. How big the objects are, that is their mass, and how close they are to each other. But here's where it gets cool. Gravity isn't just a two-object dance. It's a complex space choreography. Take our solar system, for example. The sun plays the lead role using its gravitational pull to keep all the planets in their orbits. But each planet also has its own gravitational mojo, tugging at the sun and even its neighboring planets. Then, a few hundred years later, another hero, Albert Einstein, took gravity to a whole new level. He described the theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, gravity isn't just a regular force. In reality, it's curving and warping the fabric of space-time. Think of it as a heavyweight champion sitting on a rubber sheet. The sheet bends and curves under the weight, and the smaller objects nearby can't help but roll towards the heavyweight. Now, even though we can't see space's curves with our own eyes, we can see what happens to objects that get caught in its grasp. Getting pulled by gravity is like being caught in a whirlwind of forces. The caught object starts spiraling downward, just like a coin in those penny slot cyclone machines you find at tourist shops or it might move gracefully in circles, like bicycles racing around a velodrome track. Gravity is the primordial force that guides our entire world. Without it, there would be no stars, no galaxies, nothing. But where does it come from? Well, that's the million dollar question. And we don't have a complete answer just yet, but we do have some guesses. 
First of all, we know that gravity is more than just a feature of space. It's a force that pulls things together. Surprisingly, it's the weakest force among them all. But let's take a different look at gravity. Something that may surprise you. Instead of being a force that directly pushes or pulls objects from a distance, it's more like a dance. Gravity, as amazing as it is, doesn't perform alone in this dance. It shares the spotlight with other forces, like electromagnetism, for example. Let's imagine two electrons. There are dancers. Now, they don't directly push or pull each other like you might expect. Instead, one electron creates a special kind of field around itself, like an invisible force field. This field sets the stage for the show. The other electron senses this field and starts to twirl and interact with it. It's like they're following some choreography. And when we watch this dance, it looks as if the second electron is being pushed or pulled by the first one. But in reality, it's all about the intricate movements and interplay between the dancers and the field they're dancing in. The dancers never touch each other directly, but their interactions through these fields make it seem like they're connected. It's a magical display of fields and movements coming together to create the illusion of forces at play. The thing we call gravity. So even though it's not a force in the usual way, it behaves like one. We call it an emergent force, because it emerges or comes out from the way space and objects interact. Which is why, if we want to get technical, some scientists prefer to avoid the words gravitational force and opt for the term interaction. It's just a way for particles to mingle and exchange energy and information. Electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions, they're all part of this grand soiree. At least that's one of the theories. Some scientists also think that gravity might be made up of tiny particles called gravitons. These sneaky particles work behind the scenes, making objects attract each other. However, we haven't been able to directly see these elusive gravitons yet. So, according to this theory, gravity is both a force and a potential particle. As you can see, we have some struggles with explaining how gravity works on a large scale. But at least we have a good understanding of how it behaves in certain situations, like how planets orbit the sun, or how objects fall to the ground and stuff. But what happens when we zoom into the atomic scale? And what if we venture into the depths of black holes and the Big Bang? Now here's where gravity's wild ride goes off the rails. First, let's enter the realm of quantum mechanics. There's something peculiar that happens in this tiny world. Gravity, the force that pulls things together, seems to take a back seat. On a microscopic scale, other forces like electromagnetism take the spotlight and become the superstars. They're overshadowing gravity. And this leaves scientists scratching their heads, wondering, is this possible? Why does gravity suddenly fade away? So far, we have no idea. And when it comes to the grandest scales, where immense objects like black holes, gravity takes on a whole new level of complexity. For example, inside a black hole, laws of physics and gravity as we know them basically fall apart. It also decays when we try to understand how gravity behaved immediately after the Big Bang. Where did it even come from? We have no idea. In other words, we find ourselves in a cosmic fog when it comes to understanding gravity. But fear not. Scientists are working hard to learn more about this enigmatic emergent force. They're doing all sorts of experiments and using fancy technology to crack its code. Even though we still have a lot to figure out, we're making progress every day. For example, have you ever heard of gravitational lensing? It's like a mesmerizing magic trick. Imagine a beam of light as a fearless explorer, taking a straight path through the universe. But as it encounters the gravitational pull of a massive object, the light's journey becomes a wild roller coaster ride. The gravity of the massive object bends the fabric of space-time, creating a funhouse mirror effect. Our brave beam of light finds itself curving and twisting around the massive object, following a new unexpected path. But as the light changes its trajectory, it also reveals to us distant and hidden wonders that would have remained invisible otherwise. The light can magnify, distort, or even create multiple images of faraway objects. So all the things that have been playing hide and seek with us finally become visible, like black holes. There's also a mind-blowing idea called gravitational waves. Einstein predicted their existence tens of years ago, but only recently have we finally been able to confirm them. And that was a huge breakthrough in the science world. These waves carry the echoes of cataclysmic cosmic events, such as the collision of massive black holes or the birth of newborn stars. 
Just like dropping a pebble into a serene pond, these crazy events cause a ripple effect. But instead of water, it's space-time itself that ripples and warps. Scientists have just recently developed a way to listen to these whispers. They've created instruments capable of detecting these gravitational waves. These instruments, known as interferometers, are like ears that are finely tuned to catch the subtle vibrations of the universe. But one thing's for sure. Gravity is a superstar that shapes our universe. It keeps everything around us connected and rules our entire universe. The quest to unveil its ultimate secrets continues, and it's a thrilling adventure for scientists and curious minds alike. You decide to go out for a morning jog for the first time in your life. You put on your headphones and get ready for something hard and unpleasant. But as soon as you go outside, you feel an extraordinary lightness. At first, you enjoy it and speed up, but then you realize that something's wrong. You're running too fast and too easily. You feel like you've just taken off a heavy backpack that you've been carrying all your life. You're so fast, you think you must have a superpower now. But you notice another athlete running as quickly as you. You notice a puddle ahead of you and jump over it. You jump so far and so high, it feels physically impossible. You fall to the ground, shocked. Then you notice there are no scratches on your body and the ground feels lighter. You stop the music in your headphones and turn on the radio. All the news reports say the gravity on the entire planet has decreased by half. Thanks to gravity, we stand on the ground and don't fly away into the sky. This power allows our planet to revolve around the sun and the moon to revolve around us. Heavy things seem heavy because of gravity. And now, something has happened to the Earth's core, and the mass of our planet has decreased. This is the reason for the change in gravity. People happily run out of their houses and jump twice as high and further than they used to. Any objects seem twice as light to you. Your body has become lighter, so you can easily stand on your hands. But still, you don't feel like a superhero. You can't lift a car even if its weight was reduced by half. But now, parkour is easier for everyone than before. Your body's weight has decreased, which means you get less damage when you fall. However, panic quickly replaces the joy of the new conditions. It becomes hard for you to breathe, the same as all other people. The air has become lighter. The updated force of gravity has reduced the air pressure by half. Now you feel like you're at an altitude of 16,500 feet among the streets of a usual town. It's like you're halfway to the top of Mount Everest. The air is no longer as dense, and the main part of it has settled in the atmosphere. In the beginning, everyone experiences massive dizziness and panic. You feel like there's not enough air in your lungs, so you get nervous. To solve this problem, you have to learn to breathe slowly and evenly. Thanks to this, you calm down a bit. Others also learn to be more balanced and don't live in a hurry anymore. All of you experience less stress and enjoy every day. Then scientists create unique oxygen masks. You put it on, take a breath, and a special filter puts pressure on the oxygen molecules, making the air denser. After a couple of decades, people will take off these masks as they'll ultimately get used to the new conditions new generations will be born with adapted lungs. The Earth's atmosphere is expanding. It seems the sky has risen higher and acquired a darkish hue. Satellites flying around the Earth's orbit are now inside our atmosphere, but the Earth's gravity still attracts them. You see thousands of satellites burning up. Some of the space debris survives the atmospheric shield and falls to the ground. A meteor shower begins. Space trash crashes into houses, roads, trees, and cars. You and the rest of the people decide to wait out the storm underground, in the subway or basements. Fortunately, the shower doesn't last long. People come out of their hiding and look at the sky in surprise. The moon changes its previous position and slowly flies away. Soon, it disappears completely. Our planet is now like a heavy ball in the center of a huge blanket. That blanket is gravity. It bends under the ball's weight. If you put any light object on the blanket, it will roll down to Earth. But if an object is moving at high speed, 
it will be able to spin on the blanket's edge and not fall into the center. Thanks to such speed, the moon doesn't fall on us, but at the same time, it can't fly away. Now that gravity has decreased, the blanket has become twice as loose. The rotation speed allows the moon to fly out of our gravitational field. It just goes into space. People will be able to observe the wandering moon for a long time through telescopes. Meteorites might crash into it. It could also find another planet with stronger gravity and will revolve around this new home. The moon may stay in place, but will be revolving around the Earth at a slower speed. In any case, there will be no more tides on our planet and the sea level will remain the same. In the sea, you can also feel the changes. It's much easier for you to stay on the water and you can swim faster. But the coolest thing is running along the shore. The splashes are floating in different directions so slowly and beautifully. The waves are running on the sand in slow motion too. The weight of cars, planes, and ships has reduced, and so people consume less gas now. You can drive twice as far with a full tank. Fuel transportation is easier, and less energy is spent on flights. Gasoline is becoming cheaper. The decrease in gravity inspires space tourism development. It becomes much easier for people to fly out of the Earth's orbit. Winter has come. You're walking down the street during a snowfall. It seems to you the snowflakes are stuck in the air as they're so slow. You step on the ice and realize that it's almost impossible to walk on such a slippery surface. Your weight has decreased and the pressure of your feet on the ice is twice as weak. You're sliding and can't stop. You often fall, but you don't feel any harm. When the wind is strong, it's hard to stay on your feet. If you jump, you may even fly away. The grip of wheels on the road deteriorates. A driver can no longer brake abruptly. The wheels don't spin, but the car continues to slide for a while. That's why new speed limits are being introduced all over the world. You can still enjoy extraordinary strength and long jumps, but after a few generations, the human body will evolve and fully adapt to these conditions. People and animals will be born taller and bulkier. Majestic tigers the size of a truck are walking through the city streets. Flamingos the size of a plane are flying in the dark blue sky. But the worst thing is that the size of insects has increased too. A regular cockroach can now grow to be the size of a computer mouse, and tarantulas become twice the size of an adult palm. At the same time, all living beings become lighter in weight. Humans will become elegant and agile creatures. Our bones and muscles will stretch. The structure of the entire human body will change. We'll become thinner and smoother. Blood in the veins and vessels will flow more slowly, and it will greatly impair the brain's work, but only in the beginning. In the future, the body will expand. The brain will increase, as will the number of neural connections inside. The lungs will become more sensitive and spacious. People will be smarter and wiser. All devices and materials will be developed according to the new conditions. A cup, a pencil, a plate, phones, and other gadgets. Everything will get lighter and more fragile. If an ordinary person gets into such a world, they'll feel like a superhero. You'll be able to punch through lightweight walls and doors and break bricks with your hand. New people won't match your power, but you'll seem too small and clumsy to them. How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. 
Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much. Just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T-Rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago.
At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. Oh, gravity, you heartless so-and-so. Well, that's what I think when I trip over a stone and fall face down. Of course, I'm not clumsy, you know. Anyway, gravity is a constant, right? Something entirely unshakable that we can always rely on in this ever-changing world. Unlike, you know, love. Feeling romantic, sorry. But what if I told you that it's not as honest and clear as you think? There are places on our planet where gravity behaves like it's gone crazy. And that's why you clicked here. So let's take a look. Magnetic Hill in Leh, India There's a stretch of road in India that's been attracting tourists from all over the world. It's no different looking from the surrounding landscape, and you could easily pass it by without noticing, if not for one very unusual and a bit creepy thing. If you stop your car on the magnetic hill going up the slope and put it on neutral, it'll start crawling upwards, eventually reaching the speed of up to 12 miles per hour. They say there's some sort of magnetic force at work here that tugs cars up the hill, hence the name. On top of that, even airplanes are said to gain altitude above this place. Skeptics offer another explanation, though. It's just the lay of the land that creates an illusion of going upwards, while in fact, you're moving down the hill and vice versa. Whatever the truth, I'd like to see it for myself. Would you? Tell me down in the comments. The Crooked Forest, Poland Near the village of Nova Tarnovo, there's a forest in the depth of which you can find a strangely looking pine tree. Planted in the 1930s, there are 400 trees that sharply twist to the north almost at the roots and then grow upwards in a semicircle. Although scientists offer different theories about the tree's weird growth, nobody can say for sure what made them look like that. Some say it's people who did it, while others believe it's a gravitational anomaly that somehow pushed the trees down. 
The trouble with this version, though, is that it would have had to stay there for years, and that only affected the trees. Still, no certain explanation exists anyways, so who knows? A waterfall, Faroe Islands. Ever seen an upward-moving waterfall? You can have a look at one on the Faroe Islands, halfway from Iceland to Scotland. But if you were expecting me to tell you an unbelievable story about a mysterious force pushing the water up the rock, then sorry, no such thing here. The truth, however, is quite jaw-dropping anyway. The winds in this place are so powerful that they lift the water and throw it back up. I guess it was this kind of wind that allowed Mary Poppins to travel on her umbrella. Sounds good. In fact, this waterfall is not unique. There are several more places on Earth where winds create an illusion of defied gravity. For example, there's the Kinder River in England that has a waterfall constantly struggling with the wind. It's so strong that half of the Cascades' water seems to just fly up without ever touching the bottom of the drop. Hoover Dam in Nevada, USA If you ever get up to the top of the dam, which is about 726 feet high, you can try a little trick. Take a bottle of water and pour it over the edge. You'll see the water flow up instead of spilling down. Once again, this isn't really any magic or unnatural phenomenon. The wind up here is simply too strong for the water to fall, just like with the waterfall on the Faroe Islands. Here, though, it looks even more impressive since you can do it yourself. Dokapi Road, South Korea Another gravitational anomaly located on a road. Locals once found out that if you put an empty can or a bottle on the ground, it will immediately start rolling uphill. Unlike other such places in the world, though, Dokabi Road doesn't just create an illusion. When you walk down the slope, you don't feel as if you're going up. Everything's pretty normal. But once you put down an object that can roll, it will do that in the opposite direction than it should. Local authorities were quick to get the idea and put a signpost directing curious tourists to the mysterious road. Golden Rock, Burma If you happen to be in Burma, these days it's also called Myanmar, make sure to visit this well-known site. A gold-leaf-covered boulder sits upon the edge of a cliff, and a small pagoda is built on top of it. The impressive thing about the rock is that it only lightly touches the cliff for support. In fact, it looks like the boulder will fall any minute now, but it has been standing like that for centuries. On top of that, the pagoda built upon it is not really a recent addition, so it's quite an unusual sight to see. The rock seems to be saying, gravity? Hmm, I don't care about that stuff. The legend has it that what keeps the boulder in place is a single strand of Buddha's hair. Well, I don't know about that, but you can check out the rock for yourself and see that it's not attached to the cliff by anything. And yet, it's not budged for 2,500 years. Something must be at work here, huh? Stone of Davasco, Argentina If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the Stone of Davasco. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately, today you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people in the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. Well, not exactly put it together chip by chip, they made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Devil's Tower in Wyoming, USA Remember this place from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind? If not, you should go watch it, but not right now. This place doesn't make you feel like you're witnessing some magic and doesn't really trick gravity right before your eyes. Sounds almost boring compared with the rest of the sights on my list, right? But the true mind-blowing feature of Devil's Tower 
is that scientists can't explain how it came to existence in the first place. You see, it's an 867-foot rock formation with walls so steep they're basically vertical. But that isn't even the main thing. This piece of stone just rose amid rolling plains of Wyoming with nothing like it for miles and miles around. So how is it that such a flat landscape could have suddenly given birth to something so tall? Theories abound, but nobody has the answer yet. My theory? Well, perhaps here is where the Earth has a giant Audi belly button. Well then, you come up with a better theory. Oregon Vortex, USA The house of mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. And there's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in this shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoided approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet. And voila, a perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity, a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Hudson Bay, Canada Okay, we've talked about some pretty ambiguous stuff. But now it's time for the real deal, the Hudson Bay Anomaly. This is probably the only place in the world where gravity is indeed lower than anywhere else on the planet. Even skeptics can't smirk at it because the difference has been measured with precision equipment. So does it mean that the gravity here is as low as, say, on the moon then? Unfortunately, or is it luckily, I'm not sure yet, the difference is minuscule. The exact value is 0.005% or 1 200th of a percent. You won't be able to feel it even if you try your hardest, but it's still there. Scientists say this anomaly exists because of the ice sheet that covered the area about 10,000 years ago. It compressed the rocks so much that they still can't fully recover, shifting the gravitational field in Hudson Bay. Sometime in the future, though, the gravity will return to normal in this area as well. No moonwalk for me, then. You decide to go out for a morning jog for the first time in your life. You put on your headphones and get ready for something hard and unpleasant. But as soon as you go outside, you feel an extraordinary lightness. At first, you enjoy it and speed up, but then you realize that something's wrong. You're running too fast and too easily. You feel like you've just taken off a heavy backpack that you've been carrying all your life. You're so fast, you think you must have a superpower now. But you notice another athlete running as quickly as you. You notice a puddle ahead of you and jump over it. You jump so far and so high, it feels physically impossible. You fall to the ground, shocked. Then you notice there are no scratches on your body and the ground feels lighter. You stop the music in your headphones and turn on the radio. All the news reports say the gravity on the entire planet has decreased by half. Thanks to gravity, we stand on the ground and don't fly away into the sky. This power allows our planet to revolve around the sun and the moon to revolve around us. Heavy things seem heavy because of gravity. And now, something has happened to the Earth's core, and the mass of our planet has decreased. This is the reason for the change in gravity. People happily run out of their houses and jump twice as high and further than they used to. Any objects seem twice as light to you. Your body has become lighter, so you can easily stand on your hands. But still, you don't feel like a superhero. You can't lift a car, even if its weight was reduced by half. But now, parkour is easier for everyone than before. Your body's weight has decreased, which means you get less damage when you fall. However, panic quickly replaces the joy of the new conditions. It becomes hard for you to breathe, the same as all other people. The air has become lighter. The updated force of gravity has reduced the air pressure by half. Now you feel like you're at an altitude of 16,500 feet among the streets of a usual town. It's like you're halfway to the top of Mount Everest, 
the air is no longer as dense, and the main part of it has settled in the atmosphere. In the beginning, everyone experiences massive dizziness and panic. You feel like there's not enough air in your lungs, so you get nervous. To solve this problem, you have to learn to breathe slowly and evenly. Thanks to this, you calm down a bit. Others also learn to be more balanced and don't live in a hurry anymore. All of you experience less stress and enjoy every day. Then scientists create unique oxygen masks. You put it on, take a breath, and a special filter puts pressure on the oxygen molecules, making the air denser. After a couple of decades, people will take off these masks as they'll ultimately get used to the new conditions. New generations will be born with adapted lungs. The Earth's atmosphere is expanding. It seems the sky has risen higher and acquired a darkish hue. Satellites flying around the Earth's orbit are now inside our atmosphere, but the Earth's gravity still attracts them. You see thousands of satellites burning up. Some of the space debris survives the atmospheric shield and falls to the ground. A meteor shower begins. Space trash crashes into houses, roads, trees, and cars. You and the rest of the people decide to wait out the storm underground, in the subway or basements. Fortunately, the shower doesn't last long. People come out of their hiding and look at the sky in surprise. The moon changes its previous position and slowly flies away. Soon, it disappears completely. Our planet is now like a heavy ball in the center of a huge blanket. That blanket is gravity. It bends under the ball's weight. If you put any light object on the blanket, it will roll down to Earth. But if an object is moving at high speed, it will be able to spin on the blanket's edge and not fall into the center. Thanks to such speed, the moon doesn't fall on us, but at the same time, it can't fly away. Now that gravity has decreased, the blanket has become twice as loose. The rotation speed allows the moon to fly out of our gravitational field. It just goes into space. People will be able to observe the wandering moon for a long time through telescopes. Meteorites might crash into it. It could also find another planet with stronger gravity and will revolve around this new home. The moon may stay in place, but will be revolving around the Earth at a slower speed. In any case, there will be no more tides on our planet, and the sea level will remain the same. In the sea, you can also feel the changes. It's much easier for you to stay on the water, and you can swim faster. But the coolest thing is running along the shore. The splashes are floating in different directions, so slowly and beautifully. The waves are running on the sand in slow motion, too. The weight of cars, planes, and ships has reduced, and so people consume less gas now. You can drive twice as far with a full tank. Fuel transportation is easier, and less energy is spent on flights. Gasoline is becoming cheaper. The decrease in gravity inspires space tourism development. It becomes much easier for people to fly out of the Earth's orbit. Winter has come. You're walking down the street during a snowfall. It seems to you the snowflakes are stuck in the air as they're so slow. You step on the ice and realize that it's almost impossible to walk on such a slippery surface. Your weight has decreased and the pressure of your feet on the ice is twice as weak. You're sliding and can't stop. You often fall, but you don't feel any harm. When the wind is strong, it's hard to stay on your feet. If you jump, you may even fly away. The grip of wheels on the road deteriorates. A driver can no longer brake abruptly. The wheels don't spin, but the car continues to slide for a while. That's why new speed limits are being introduced all over the world. You can still enjoy extraordinary strength and long jumps, but after a few generations, the human body will evolve and fully adapt to these conditions. People and animals will be born taller and bulkier. Majestic tigers the size of a truck are walking through the city streets. Flamingos the size of a plane are flying in the dark blue sky. But the worst thing is that the size of insects has increased too. A regular cockroach can now grow to be the size of a computer mouse, and tarantulas become twice the size of an adult palm. At the same time, all living beings become lighter in weight. Humans will become elegant and agile creatures, 
our bones and muscles will stretch. The structure of the entire human body will change. We'll become thinner and smoother. Blood in the veins and vessels will flow more slowly, and it will greatly impair the brain's work, but only in the beginning. In the future, the body will expand. The brain will increase, as will the number of neural connections inside. The lungs will become more sensitive and spacious. People will be smarter and wiser. All devices and materials will be developed according to the new conditions. A cup, a pencil, a plate, phones, and other gadgets. Everything will get lighter and more fragile. If an ordinary person gets into such a world, they'll feel like a superhero. You'll be able to punch through lightweight walls and doors and break bricks with your hand. New people won't match your power, but you'll seem too small and clumsy to them. You might not think about gravity much, but it affects everything we do. It's the reason why things fall down instead of flying up. It keeps us connected to the Earth, so we don't float away into space when we jump. But for physicists, gravity is something more. It's a fascinating puzzle that needs to be solved to understand how the universe works, and they're on a quest to uncover its secrets. So what's so mysterious about it? Let's see. We've learned a lot about gravity from the legendary Isaac Newton. He was the first to invent the law of gravitation. He taught us that any two objects in the universe can't help but be attracted to each other. It's like they have this secret gravitational crush going on. How strong this attraction is depends on two things. How big the objects are, that is their mass, and how close they are to each other. But here's where it gets cool. Gravity isn't just a two-object dance. It's a complex space choreography. Take our solar system, for example. The sun plays the lead role using its gravitational pull to keep all the planets in their orbits. But each planet also has its own gravitational mojo, tugging at the sun and even its neighboring planets. Then, a few hundred years later, another hero, Albert Einstein, took gravity to a whole new level. He described the theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, gravity isn't just a regular force. In reality, it's curving and warping the fabric of space-time. Think of it as a heavyweight champion sitting on a rubber sheet. The sheet bends and curves under the weight, and the smaller objects nearby can't help but roll towards the heavyweight. Now, even though we can't see space's curves with our own eyes, we can see what happens to objects that get caught in its grasp. Getting pulled by gravity is like being caught in a whirlwind of forces. The caught object starts spiraling downward, just like a coin in those penny slot cyclone machines you find at tourist shops or it might move gracefully in circles, like bicycles racing around a velodrome track. Gravity is the primordial force that guides our entire world. Without it, there would be no stars, no galaxies, nothing. But where does it come from? Well, that's the million dollar question. And we don't have a complete answer just yet, but we do have some guesses. First of all, we know that gravity is more than just a feature of space. It's a force that pulls things together. Surprisingly, it's the weakest force among them all. But let's take a different look at gravity. Something that may surprise you. Instead of being a force that directly pushes or pulls objects from a distance, it's more like a dance. Gravity, as amazing as it is, doesn't perform alone in this dance. It shares the spotlight with other forces, like electromagnetism, for example. Let's imagine two electrons. There are dancers. Now, they don't directly push or pull each other like you might expect. Instead, one electron creates a special kind of field around itself, like an invisible force field. This field sets the stage for the show. The other electron senses this field and starts to twirl and interact with it. It's like they're following some choreography. And when we watch this dance, it looks as if the second electron is being pushed or pulled by the first one. But in reality, it's all about the intricate movements and interplay between the dancers and the field they're dancing in. The dancers never touch each other directly, but their interactions through these fields make it seem like they're connected. It's a magical display of fields and movements coming together to create the illusion of forces at play. The thing we call gravity. So even though it's not a force in the usual way, it behaves like one. We call it an emergent force, because it emerges or comes out from the way space and objects interact. Which is why, if we want to get technical, some scientists prefer to avoid the words gravitational force and opt for the term interaction. 
It's just a way for particles to mingle and exchange energy and information. Electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions, they're all part of this grand soiree. At least that's one of the theories. Some scientists also think that gravity might be made up of tiny particles called gravitons. These sneaky particles work behind the scenes, making objects attract each other. However, we haven't been able to directly see these elusive gravitons yet. So, according to this theory, gravity is both a force and a potential particle. As you can see, we have some struggles with explaining how gravity works on a large scale. But at least we have a good understanding of how it behaves in certain situations, like how planets orbit the sun, or how objects fall to the ground and stuff. But what happens when we zoom into the atomic scale? And what if we venture into the depths of black holes and the Big Bang? Now here's where gravity's wild ride goes off the rails. First, let's enter the realm of quantum mechanics. There's something peculiar that happens in this tiny world. Gravity, the force that pulls things together, seems to take a back seat. On a microscopic scale, other forces like electromagnetism take the spotlight and become the superstars. They're overshadowing gravity, and this leaves scientists scratching their heads, wondering, is this possible? Why does gravity suddenly fade away? So far, we have no idea. And when it comes to the grandest scales, where immense objects like black holes, gravity takes on a whole new level of complexity. For example, inside a black hole, laws of physics and gravity as we know them basically fall apart. It also decays when we try to understand how gravity behaved immediately after the Big Bang. Where did it even come from? We have no idea. In other words, we find ourselves in a cosmic fog when it comes to understanding gravity. But fear not, scientists are working hard to learn more about this enigmatic emergent force. They're doing all sorts of experiments and using fancy technology to crack its code. Even though we still have a lot to figure out, we're making progress every day. For example, have you ever heard of gravitational lensing? It's like a mesmerizing magic trick. Imagine a beam of light as a fearless explorer, taking a straight path through the universe. But as it encounters the gravitational pull of a massive object, the light's journey becomes a wild roller coaster ride. The gravity of the massive object bends the fabric of space-time, creating a funhouse mirror effect. Our brave beam of light finds itself curving and twisting around the massive object, following a new unexpected path. But as the light changes its trajectory, it also reveals to us distant and hidden wonders that would have remained invisible otherwise. The light can magnify, distort, or even create multiple images of faraway objects. So all the things that have been playing hide-and-seek with us finally become visible, like black holes. There's also a mind-blowing idea called gravitational waves. Einstein predicted their existence tens of years ago, but only recently have we finally been able to confirm them. And that was a huge breakthrough in the science world. These waves carry the echoes of cataclysmic cosmic events, such as the collision of massive black holes or the birth of newborn stars. Just like dropping a pebble into a serene pond, these crazy events cause a ripple effect. But instead of water, it's space-time itself that ripples and warps. Scientists have just recently developed a way to listen to these whispers. They've created instruments capable of detecting these gravitational waves. These instruments, known as interferometers, are like ears that are finely tuned to catch the subtle vibrations of the universe. But one thing's for sure. Gravity is a superstar that shapes our universe. It keeps everything around us connected and rules our entire universe. The quest to unveil its ultimate secrets continues, and it's a thrilling adventure for scientists and curious minds alike. Legend has it that in the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton noticed an apple fall from a tree and began wondering why the fruit had fallen to the ground and not upward or sideways. Well, that would be freaky. After years of studying, he concluded that gravity must be the culprit. The scientists called it a force of attraction that existed between all objects. But it was Albert Einstein, many years later, that revolutionized these ideas about gravity. Legend also has it that he wasn't completely satisfied with Newton's findings. Something just didn't seem right. As a young scientist, Einstein had some trouble formulating his theories trying to explain the behavior of moving objects. When an experiment came to his mind, he called it the happiest of thoughts. Gravity feels like the sensation of riding in an ascending elevator. 
He called it general relativity. Einstein began working tirelessly, trying to prove this idea. At one point, he even complained he was on the brink of losing his mind. Now, in the simplest terms, general relativity claims that gravity is the curvature or warping of space. The greater mass an object has, the more it warps the space around it. Imagine a heavy ball resting on a trampoline. The rubber sheet under it gets warped under its weight. It's the same with our sun. It's big enough to twist space across the entire solar system. That's why our planet, as well as all the others, orbit around the star. This warping also impacts how we measure time. If you look at your watch, time seems to go by at the same rate every day. But if you hike to the top of a mountain and your friend wanders through a valley at the bottom of this mountain, you'll see that your watches will calculate time differently. One watch will tick faster, while the hands of the second one, which is traveling through the valley, will move more slowly. That's because gravity affects how fast time goes by. With these experiments in mind, Einstein concluded that gravity was not a force of attraction, but rather a curvature in the fabric of space-time. We feel gravity as a force simply because we're placed on some surface. If there was no surface and no attraction between us and this surface, we would become weightless. If you don't mind getting some weird looks, try this experiment. You'll need a bathroom scale and an elevator to ride. You'll soon see that your weight fluctuates as you move up and down in the building in the elevator. The gravitational force is the same, but your weight is different because the elevator speeds up and slows down. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts literally move along with the station, so there's nothing to push them against the side of the station so that they have some weight. Even if we still think of gravity as a force, it's the weakest one we know. First of all, it only attracts. There's no negative counterpart that could push things away. And weirdly, even though this force is strong enough to keep galaxies together, we still overcome it every day. Every time you lift an object off the floor, you overcome the force of gravity produced by the entire Earth. Ooh! Just to paint a better picture, Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than the power of a refrigerator magnet. The fact that our planet has gravity also affects the way we look and act. All creatures on Earth are limited in growth by the height of their skeleton and by how much weight it can carry, which is directly proportional to gravity. That's why some marine creatures can grow bigger. The largest animal on our planet right now is the Antarctic blue whale. It's about the size of two school buses combined. That's because sea creatures can float, which slightly counteracts gravity. The effects of gravity can be seen in people, too. We are taller in the morning than we are in the evening. Our everyday activities and the added effect of gravity make the cartilage in our ankles, knees, hips, back, and neck compress. Once you have overnight rest, the cartilage swells back to normal. Gravity might also affect your shower routine. That is, if you're an astronaut. They have to rely on the old-fashioned way of bathing up there on the space station. They can't take a shower since the force of gravity up there is different and water doesn't flow as it should. Instead, they use liquid soap, water, and no-rinse shampoo. They first squeeze some liquid soap and water from pre-made water pouches onto their skin. Next, they open the no-rinse shampoo and add a little water to wash their hair. Towels are then used to wipe off the excess water, which is really precious in space. To make sure they recycle it, an airflow system quickly evaporates excess water. Gravity and weight shouldn't be confused. Astronauts on the space station do float, and you may sometimes hear that they are in the state of zero gravity. It's far from the truth, though, since gravity up there is about 90% of its value on our planet. But astronauts look and feel weightless since weight is the force a certain object exerts on them back on Earth. Most creatures have evolved to sense and adapt to Earth's gravitational pull. In the sea, for instance, some fish have floating calcium carbonate deposits in their heads. Scientists call them ear stones, and they're pulled down by gravity. They act like a fish's internal compass. Now, plants have evolved to grow starch grains in the tips of their roots. They use this amazing feature to force their roots deep down into the soil. 
As little as we seem to understand it these days, we do need gravity for way more things than we can imagine. For instance, some bacteria become even more dangerous in space where there's little to no gravity. Salmonella, for example, the type of bacteria that is known to cause food poisoning, becomes three times nastier in the condition of microgravity. So you really gotta cook your chicken. Our own moon stays where it is because of the effects of gravity, too. If it weren't for this force, our satellite would have floated away by now. But it's held in place by Earth's gravitational pull. Objects with the biggest gravitational pulls in the universe are black holes. Thankfully, our planet is really far away from any of them. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light itself. Similarly, gravity is different on each planet. And because of that, things weigh differently depending on which planet they're on. Take Earth, for example. An object that weighs 100 pounds here would only be 38 pounds on Mercury. But if you're planning on losing weight fast, try booking a trip to Pluto. Someone who weighs 150 pounds on Earth would weigh no more than 10 pounds on Pluto. The same person would weigh considerably more on Jupiter, which is the planet with the most powerful gravity. 150 pounds on Earth would turn into more than 354 pounds there. Mm, No thanks. Remember that experiment with watches ticking at different levels of elevation? It turns out that gravity isn't spread evenly on the surface of Earth. Why? Because our planet isn't a perfect sphere. The mass of Earth isn't evenly distributed either. That's why you get variations in gravity in different locations. More so, gravity is weaker at the equator because of the centrifugal forces produced by the planet's rotation. Since we've always perceived gravity as a force, we seem to believe that it has somewhat of a suction motion. But it's not exactly true. Back in 1998, scientists were baffled to see that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So they linked this to the repulsive gravity of mysterious dark energy. We now know that dark energy makes up for more than 60% of the mass energy of our whole universe. But since nobody knows what it actually is, we can only make assumptions. And one that's largely accepted is quantum theory, which seems to claim that gravity pushes rather than pulls things in. You got all that? I may need to watch this one again. feet with the Earth's gravity. Verification complete. Now the simulation room will recreate Mercury. Ugh, it's so hot in here. Yes, it's like standing next to a volcano. Your jump is four feet high. Now switch to Venus. Wow, this place looks scary. On the real Venus, everything is toxic. I feel no difference. Yes, the gravity here is almost the same as on Earth. Switch to the moon. Gravity on the moon is 10 times lighter than Earth's. 9 feet. The next one is Mars. Huh? It's pretty comfortable here. The gravity here is the same as on Mercury. 4 feet. Now, prepare for the struggle. Huh? What do you... There is no solid surface on Jupiter. Although Jupiter is a great deal larger in size, its surface gravity is just 2.4 times that of the surface gravity of Earth. Ugh, it's hard to even stand here. Only half a foot. Got it. Switch to Saturn. There is no solid surface here either. But Saturn's gravity is almost the same as Earth's. Now Uranus. It's so cold. It's five times warmer here than on the real Uranus. Seriously? Ah, my legs are... 1.7 feet. Gravity is slightly weaker than Earth's. That's Neptune for you. Your jumps are 1.3 feet high. Gravity is slightly stronger than Earth's. Get me out of here. Turn off. How do people usually describe planets? Massive, freezing, boiling hot, seismically active, 
let's admit it, Shiny is not normally on the list. Unless we're talking about a world called LTT9779b, which might be the shiniest planet we've ever seen. This exoplanet, which is basically any planet outside our solar system, is ultra-hot and acts like a giant space mirror because it's covered with a thick layer of reflective metallic clouds. This unusual world is located about 264 light-years away from our planet. And the most amazing thing about it is that it reflects approximately 80% of all the light its parent star sends its way. For comparison, Earth reflects a mere 30% of the light it gets from the Sun. The bizarre exoplanet is even more reflective than the shiniest planet in the solar system, Venus, which reflects around 75% of sunlight due to its thick clouds. LTT9779b is five times as large as Earth, which makes it the largest space mirror ever discovered. By the way, this world was found by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite mission in 2020. But the highly reflective nature of the planet was uncovered later thanks to a follow-up investigation conducted by the European Space Agency Exoplanet Hunting Spacecraft, CHEOPS, which stands for Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite. Now, imagine a planet the size of our ice giant Neptune. It's a burning world floating close to its star. If you stepped on its surface and looked up, you'd see heavy clouds of metals floating over your head, raining down titanium droplets. The planet's size, coupled with its insane temperatures, allow astronomers to classify the planet as an ultra-hot Neptune. Now, a planet's high reflectivity is a quality known as albedo. And in the case of our shiny world, it's albedo mystifies scientists. All because most planets that are not ice worlds or planets with thick layers of reflective clouds, like Venus, normally have low albedos. Their atmosphere, or surfaces, simply absorb the light coming from their stars, preventing it from getting reflected back into space. And initially, researchers were sure that LT9779b would have a low albedo. After that, by no means was it an ice world not with the surface temperatures reaching 3,650 degrees Fahrenheit on the side of the planet permanently facing its parent star. It was supposed to be too hot for water clouds to form. Even clouds of metal or glass wouldn't be able to form in such a scorching climate. Astronomers expected a planet like that to have its atmosphere destroyed by its star, which would leave behind a lifeless, rocky world. That's why discovering metallic clouds was so unexpected. Of course, researchers were eager to find out how such clouds could have formed. It had remained a mystery until they decided to think about the cloud formation in the same way as condensation that appears in the bathroom after you take a hot shower. There are two ways to steam up your bathroom. You can cool the air until the water vapor condenses, or you can keep hot water running until clouds form. It will happen when the air in the bathroom becomes so saturated with vapor that it won't be able to hold it anymore. So, researchers came to the conclusion that, most likely, the atmosphere of the shiny planet became oversaturated with silicate at one point. And then, metal started vaporizing due to boiling hot temperatures on the permanent day side of the planet. But if you think that the reflective nature of LT9779b is its only unusual feature, you might want to hear this. The exoplanet is an example of an extremely rare planetary type, an ultra-hot Neptune. Astronomers have been searching for such planets for decades, but those preferred to remain a mystery. The fact that the planet survived so close to its star might be linked to its high reflectivity. Some experts believe that the metal clouds covering the planet probably reflect light and prevent the planet from overheating and evaporating. Plus, such a highly metallic atmosphere is much heavier and harder to blow away than any other. 
Now, about 850 light years away from Earth, a planet called WASP 121b orbits its star. This planet is a hot Jupiter, which means it's a gas giant moving very close to its star. And because of such a short distance, the planet is also insanely hot. The average day temperature there is around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Interestingly, just like our previous shiny world, this planet also has metallic clouds floating over its surface. But that's not the only oddity. WASP-121b has a bizarre oblong shape. Can it be because the planet is tidally locked to its star? It means that one of its sides always faces the star, while the other is always turned to the darkness of the cosmos. In other words, it's always daytime on one side of the planet and nighttime on the other, which causes crazy temperature differences. Researchers think it might be the reason for the metallic clouds. The water cycle on WASP-121b is also pretty bizarre to say the least. On the illuminated side, the atoms that make up the planet's water get ripped apart by the insane temperatures. After that, they get blown by winds moving at 11,000 miles per hour to the other side of the planet. There, much lower temperatures allow the atom to recombine into water molecules. At the same time, the nighttime side is cold enough for metal clouds consisting of iron and corundum to form. When these clouds migrate to the daytime side of the planet, they vaporize and rain down metal on the planet's surface. But if these clouds don't seem impressive enough, I've got more. Astronomers predict that the planet will rip itself apart in the next several million years because of its incredibly fast winds and wild temperatures. Plus, the gravitational pull of the planet's parent star also plays its role in this dark prediction. Since WASP-121b is so close to the star, the star's gravity pulls the planet into a weird oblong shape and makes gases like iron and magnesium leak from the planet's atmosphere. This pull is so strong that the planet is always on the verge of a tidal disruption. If it ever happens, the planet will come apart for good, metallic clouds and all. Just 20 light years away from the sun, which isn't such a great distance when we talk about space, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming our home Milky Way galaxy. But even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. It's 4 million times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. The exoplanet also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered in 2016, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf which is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists got some proof that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptionally strong magnetic field helps the planet produce the auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. Another planet you probably shouldn't set foot on is WASP-76b. There, it rains iron on the night side of the planet. And the temperature on the daytime side rises up to 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit that's hot enough to vaporize most metals. This exoplanet is a bit larger than Jupiter in terms of size and is located 640 light years away from Earth. Such terrifying weather conditions in this world are caused by its unusual orbit. The distance between the planet and its parent star is 10 times shorter than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. Look at this ominous dark cloud. Is it rotating? What on earth is happening here? What you see is called a supercell. 
It's a storm, often a thunderstorm, that contains an updraft rotating about a vertical axis. That's why they're also called rotating thunderstorms. There are actually four types of thunderstorms, single cell, multi-cell, squall line, and supercell. Out of them all, supercells are the rarest and the most severe. They're typically isolated from other thunderstorms and last for two to four hours. Supercells are very common for the Great Plains of the United States. In particular, the area known as Tornado Alley. But they can occur in other parts of the world too. For example, in Europe, Argentina, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. These storms can be any size, large and small, high or low topped. Supercells are also associated with the most severe tornadoes, even though not every supercell can create one. These storms usually produce great amounts of torrential rainfall and hail, and are accompanied by powerful winds and downbursts. Downbursts are powerful winds that come down from a thunderstorm. Once they hit the ground, they spread out very quickly. These winds are dangerous, since they can cause a lot of damage. Even though they're often confused with tornadoes, downbursts are a totally different phenomenon. Let's have a look at how a downburst forms. At the beginning of a thunderstorm, there's a powerful updraft. That's why the cloud grows vertically and hailstones and raindrops start forming inside. The storm matures and the updraft keeps feeding the cloud with unstable moist air. Hailstones and raindrops are now big and heavy enough to fall to the ground. But sometimes the updraft is so strong that it suspends huge amounts of hail and rain in the upper part and the center of the storm. But let's say some dry air gets into the middle and lower parts of the storm. It can cause a downburst. When it happens, all that amount of rain and hail from the upper part of the storm dashes toward the ground, dragging along a lot of air. All this mass gains speed. And when the downburst eventually reaches the ground, it's like a stream of water coming out of a faucet and hitting the sink. It spreads in all directions at an incredible speed, sometimes more than 100 miles per hour. But what you might most likely come across is called a microburst. It means that those terrible winds are confined to an area smaller than 2.5 miles across. While speaking about tornadoes, I can't but mention volcanic tornadoes. They're possibly one of the scariest natural phenomena. When a volcano erupts, it throws hot rock and ash high into the atmosphere. As for lava pieces and hot gases, they travel down the volcano's slope. When this flow is moving down, some of the gases trapped inside begin to rise and spin at the same time. They get squeezed by the surrounding air, which makes them spin faster and faster. That's how a volcanic tornado gets born. On the bright side, this phenomenon has a very short lifespan. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, that's a fire tornado, a creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno. This phenomenon is also called a fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous natural phenomenon mostly occurs during wildfires. While burning, such fires create a big area of boiling hot air just above the ground. And when this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire natos can stretch hundreds of feet into the sky. Another dangerous natural phenomenon is called a snow squall. If you get caught in a snow squall while driving, you won't find a safe place on a highway because this is an intense, but thankfully pretty short, period of heavy snowfall that comes along with powerful gusty winds and sometimes even lightning. People have known about this phenomenon for quite some time, but the term itself, as well as the warning associated with this danger, appeared only in 2018. Another danger of snow squalls is something called a flash freeze. Come to think of it, it makes sense. Rapidly dropping temperatures and freshly fallen snow glaze highways very fast. This makes controlling your car almost impossible. The next curious phenomenon I'm going to talk about happens extremely rarely and is still poorly understood. 
it's usually not something big and turbulent. Dust devils can be tiny and vanish within minutes. They've got lots of names, whirlwinds, dusters, and sand spouts. Dust devils look like funnels of sand spiraling upward from the ground. But unlike their terrifying relatives, tornadoes, these babies are normally nothing to worry about. And still, according to the definition, dust devils fall in the same category as hurricanes and tornadoes. All three natural phenomena feature a column of air kind of spinning around an invisible pole. They're all formed during the collision of different types of air, moist versus dry, or hot versus cold, and so on. But hurricanes usually form over a body of water where cold air slides under warm air. Tornadoes spiral down from the sky when hot air rises through a mass of cold air, and dust devils form on the ground. Even though we call them dust devils, they can actually swirl any loose debris. The main criteria, the pieces have to be small and light enough to be lifted by a fast-moving vortex. By the way, do you know that some clouds can predict extreme weather? For example, shelf clouds. They look like something from a sci-fi movie. They form when warm and moist air gets caught in a thunderstorm updraft. These ominous clouds most often mean a storm is coming. Those huge white lumps over your head are called mammatus clouds. They can make you believe the sky is falling. Most clouds form when air rises into the atmosphere. But mammatus clouds appear when moist and cool air goes down and mixes with dry air. The result is these unique puffed rice clouds. By the way, if you see this phenomenon in the sky, bad weather is just around the corner. Morning glory clouds are extremely rare and harmless. They look like massive tubes stretching across the sky. They can snake for more than 600 miles, sitting relatively low. Most researchers agree that these clouds appear when an updraft squeezes through the cloud. This creates the signature rolling appearance. The cool air at the back of the cloud makes it sink downward. The best, but not the only, place to see the morning glory is Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. If you decide to travel there to see these clouds, choose a period from late September to early November. Ever seen huge round disks in the sky? Most likely, those were lenticular clouds. They usually form over large and high places, like mountains or hills. When strong wind bumps into some barrier, this creates an air wave. The air kind of wraps around the obstacle. And the higher the barrier is, the colder the air that is rising over it becomes. At some point, the moisture it contains turns into water droplets. And they form these unusual clouds. Lenticular clouds can look like waves, a pizza, or even a stack of pancakes. And these clouds, on the contrary, form low in the sky and after some bad weather. Rainbow clouds appear on top of puffy low-altitude clouds after thunderstorms. They usually hover at the height of around 6,000 feet. When the water vapor they contain condenses, the resulting droplets act like prisms. This forms multicolored caps over the clouds. And a pretty scary bonus fact for you. One of the most common causes of wildfires is lightning from thunderstorms. But have you ever heard of a wildfire that triggered a thunderstorm? Well, now you know. It happened on May 11, 2018, not far from Amarillo, Texas. Then, the super powerful Mallard Fire not only created a massive dense cloud high in the air, but its heat also caused a violent thunderstorm that later dumped tons of quarter-sized hailstones 60 miles away in Wheeler County, Texas. Ah, you're on the grass, looking up at the blue sky, enjoying some singing birds and catching some rays. You watch different shaped clouds soaring slowly, high up in the air. Suddenly, you hear a powerful loud rumble coming from far away. You get up and notice a gigantic thick cloud ahead. But it's not the size that scares you, it's the shape. The cloud looks like a skull. Eh, don't worry, it doesn't mean anything bad's gonna happen. Anyway, it's not even a cloud. A few years ago, a skull formed out of thick smoke over Mount Vesuvius in Italy. 
That's the same volcano that erased the ancient city of Pompeii from the face of the Earth. Of course, back then, many people were afraid that the volcano would erupt again. Luckily for everyone, the volcano's still in a deep sleep. It was just a nearby forest fire that caused the famous skull cloud. But the locals weren't so sure. Some thought that the fire and the skull were set on purpose. Eh, wouldn't be the first time. Centralia, Pennsylvania. Population, well, just look around. Looks a little scary. Bare trees, no animals, no people. All the buildings are empty. Roads are all cracked and strewn with gravel. No cars, obviously. Thick smoke everywhere. This town's been burning for more than 50 years. Centralia used to be a mining town. One of its coal mines was abandoned, and locals used it as a dump for their trash. Then, according to most people, the city decided to get rid of the trash in the usual way, by burning it. The plan was a major failure. Hmm, let's see what could have possibly gone wrong here. The trash fire got deep into the mine's tunnels, ignited the coal that's still down there, and has been burning steadily ever since. The level of carbon dioxide shot up, and they had to shut down the other mines nearby for safety. No one could stop the fire, and the underground flames spread beneath the city. Roads began to warm up, the soil went sour, and the streets slowly filled with smoke and smog. In 2017, there were only five people living there. Welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria that eats leaves, grass, insects, and any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. If you lit a match over them at just the right moment, the lake would look kind of like an erupting volcano. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, on the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You, of course, climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid. Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water, I mean acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest and come back at night when it's cooler. The lake seems to grow. Right above it, you see light-filled exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. Up in the sky, underground, volcanoes, lakes? Hmm. Time to head out to sea. You get on a yacht and sail off. It doesn't matter where, this next one happens all over the world. So, the sea is crystal clear and calm, there's no wind in your sails. Everything is so peaceful… wait, what's that? You hear a loud, loud noise. Two seconds later, a huge wave, way taller than your mast, rises from the calm sea and hits your yacht. The ship manages to stay upright, and the huge wave disappears. You just survived the attack of a rogue wave. Some scientists think it happens when the surface sea current smashes into a strong headwind. Others say it happens when warm and cold currents come up against each other. Another popular theory is wave interference, where small waves team up to form one monster one. Under certain conditions, waves get a sort of superpower. Out of all the waves in the area, there'll be one which sucks the energy out of all the others. 
When it's full, the wave spits it all out. Maybe that's why the wave's so strong, but only lasts an instant. What about clouds? Scary? Well, they can be, if they're huge thunderclouds, walls of gray and black blocking out the sun, the moon, and the stars. First, you're relaxing in your backyard, then you see thunderclouds. Then you get thunderstorms, hail, floods, and even tornadoes. They're easy to spot thanks to their epic appearance. Thick, heavy, and dark. They can even sparkle inside because of lightning. That's one scary-looking cloud. But before you run away, let's see how it forms. Clouds are like roller coasters. Imagine you're a small drop of water hanging out with your friends in the ocean, waiting in line for the brand new ride that just opened up. It's time! You strap in. Nothing happens. Then you feel it. The roller coaster starts to go up, up, up. You can see all your droplet friends down there. They're so small. You keep rising, just waiting for the big whoosh. But nothing happens. Then you're so high up that you're in the clouds. It's not so scary up here, and there are loads of your friends. <laughs> nice. It's starting to get cold. You look around, it's happening to everyone. You're being turned into beautiful ice crystals, so shiny and pretty. The clouds filling up, getting kind of cramped with all those other water droplets. Still, what a peaceful, enjoyable, wow! The ride kicks back in and you start to free fall. Slowly at first, then faster and faster, thousands of your fellow drops falling back to earth, some holding on tight to the handrail, some laughing and waving their hands in the air. Woohoo! And splash! Still, I like the lightning ride better. That's one where they strap you in, you ride up, and then you play bumper cars way up in the clouds. The more times you bump into another water droplet, the more lightning you create. Now, not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano, the most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So, it's super scary volcano clouds, plus lightning. Whoa. Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. Okay, better finish the journey with something safe and beautiful. No more cloud roller coasters, please. You're in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, one of the driest places on Earth. But this desert has a beautiful secret. Every three to five years, flowers pop up out of nowhere. It's so famous, it's also called the flowering desert. Seeds lie around in the ground, just waiting for some rain. When the desert gets enough water, about 200 types of flowers sprout up. The yellow sands of the Atacama turn purple, white, green, and pink. Well, this happened in June 2009. People in certain areas in Japan left their homes after a heavy downpour, only to find fish, frogs, and tadpoles everywhere. Fields, roads, lawns, rooftops were littered with these aquatic creatures. One man was shocked to see 13 carp on and around his truck. Apparently, he stopped to count them. No one knows for sure where the bizarre rain came from. But the most popular theory claims that a powerful water spout picked up all these creatures, then it carried them through the upper atmosphere and dropped the animals on the unsuspecting people below. Shelf clouds look like something from a sci-fi movie. They form when warm and moist air gets caught in a thunderstorm updraft. These ominous clouds most often mean a storm is coming. Breathtaking rainbow clouds appear on top of cotton-like puffy clouds after thunderstorms. The puffy clouds are low-altitude ones. They usually hover at a height of around 6,000 feet. When the water vapor they contains condenses, the resulting droplets act like prisms. This forms multicolored caps over the clouds. Morning glory clouds are extremely rare. They look like massive tubes stretching across the sky. They can snake for more than 600 miles, sitting relatively low. Most researchers agree that these clouds appear when an updraft squeezes through the cloud. This creates the signature rolling appearance. The cool air at the back of the cloud makes it sink downward. The best 
But not the only place to see Morning Glory is Australia's Gulf of Carpinteria. If you decide to travel there to see these clouds, choose a period from late September to early November. It was 2012 when the sky turned first ominous dark, then yellow. After that, blue gelatinous balls started to fall to the ground. A man from the UK found these balls outside during a hailstorm. He was walking to his garage when he spotted something unusually bright among the whitish hailstones. When researchers examined this jelly rain, they found out the balls were made from the substance used in diapers or potting soil. It's used to absorb liquid. It's still unclear whether the balls fell from the sky, or maybe the melting ice made a few already existing crystals expand in the blink of an eye. Huge white lumps over your head are called mammatus clouds. They can make you believe the sky is falling. Most clouds form when the air rises into the atmosphere, but not mammatus ones. They appear when moist and cool air goes down and mixes with dry air. The result? Unique puffed rice clouds. By the way, if you spot this phenomenon, bad weather is just around the corner. Whoa, mama! Colorful nacreous clouds occur extremely high in the atmosphere. I mean, twice as high as a commercial airplane's cruising altitude. The air at such heights is extremely dry and cold. Ice crystals in nacreous clouds are much smaller than those that form more common clouds. They scatter light in a different way. And this gives the clouds their mother-of-pearl appearance. Blood rain looks more terrifying than any horror movie. But in reality, there's nothing strange or unnatural about this weather phenomenon. People have known about such scarlet-tinted rains since the time of ancient Rome. Sometimes, powerful winds lift red dust into the atmosphere and carry it far, far away to another galaxy. (laughs) In the end, this dust gets mixed with clouds, which colors the rain. By the way, dust from coal mines can make the rain black. Pollen is responsible for yellow rains, and some other kinds of dust can turn the rainwater white. In Australia, it sometimes rains spiders. That's because these creatures can balloon. That's a highly unusual way of traveling. A spider climbs to the very top of a tall tree or shrub, and then it spins several strands of silk. These strands help the spider to be carried away by the wind. It's not easy to spot ballooning, but sometimes, if the weather is especially damp and unpleasant, mass ballooning happens. And then, you can't help but pay attention. Millions of spiders set off on a journey to find another place with better conditions. It may seem like it's snowing outside, but no, those are spiders drifting down to the ground. Ever see huge round disks in the sky? Most likely, those were lenticular clouds. They usually form over large and high places, like mountains or hills. When strong winds bump into some barrier, this creates an air wave. The air kind of wraps around the obstacle, and the higher the barrier is, the colder the air that's rising over it becomes. At some point, the moisture it contains turns into water droplets, and they form the unusual clouds. Lenticular clouds can look like waves, a pizza, or even a stack of pancakes. How yummy! Volcanic tornadoes are possibly one of the most terrifying natural phenomena. When a volcano erupts, it spews red-hot rock and ash high into the air. As for solid lava pieces and hot gases, they travel down the volcano slope. When this flow moves down, some of the trapped gases begin to rise and spin at the same time. They get squeezed by the surrounding air, which makes them spin faster and faster. That's how a volcanic tornado gets born. Luckily, this phenomenon has a very short lifespan. On March 19, 2018, the inhabitants of Alabama had to run for their lives. Otherwise, they would have been hit by huge chunks of ice falling from the sky. It was the infamous hailstorm that caused millions of dollars worth of damage. After the hailstorm, the area looked gloomy. Broken shop windows, smashed car windshields, busted billboards, holes in the roofs. At least, researchers got excited when they found a hailstone near the town of Cullman. This softball-sized monster was more than 5 inches across. No wonder it set a new state record. 
Cylindrical snow donuts occur when a wind gust decides to make a snowball. It starts to roll some snow across a snowy area. If it were a real snowball, it would eventually become too heavy for the wind to move. But the snow donut center is hollowed out. This happens because its inner layer is too thin and is blown away when the donut is formed. This makes it lighter than a snowball, and that's why it also rolls farther. Unfortunately, you just can't go and find snow donuts. They're rare because they need very precise conditions to appear. Moonbows are a much rarer phenomenon than rainbows. They're caused by moonlight rather than direct sunlight and occur only when the moon is near full. Moonbows are dim and often seem to be white, but it's just an illusion. The human eye is just not sensitive enough to catch all the colors. Lightning balls are small, floating spheres of light. They can be orange, yellow, or even red. Sometimes, lightning balls descend from the sky. In other cases, they appear out of nowhere, hovering several feet above the ground. They don't emit any heat or produce very little sound. Lightning balls can bounce off objects. If they come across something electrical, like a TV, they usually disappear with a quiet pop, leaving behind the smell of sulfur. But lightning balls can also start fires or explode. Scientists believe lightning balls might be connected with thunderstorms, but there's no solid proof yet. Fog bows are almost white, pale blue on the inside, and faint red on the outside. You have higher chances of seeing a fog bow over the cold sea or ocean when warm air comes into contact with much colder air. This phenomenon also occurs when the sun is bright and the fog is thin enough for the light to get through. Pele's hair is thin lava threads. They look golden and pretty, but don't even think about picking them up. Yeah, they can harm you. The wind sometimes catches small droplets of lava coming from active volcanoes. These droplets get carried miles away from the vent. They get stretched into super-thin glass wires, also called hair lava. Some strands can be as long as 6 feet. In March 2018, those who looked up in the sky in northern Nevada saw one of the rarest and most bizarre clouds ever. It was a horseshoe cloud. Such a vortex happens when a flat cloud travels over a column of warm, rising air. This air not only gives the cloud its impressive shape, but also adds some spin to its movement. But you've got to be quick! Horseshoe clouds are very fleeting and usually last for only several minutes. Frost flowers bloom on young sea ice in the Arctic Ocean or on thin lake ice. They're fragile and delicate ice crystals. These structures grow during temperature changes. They draw moisture from the ice surface and rise, capturing bacteria and salt. You can find frost flowers in Antarctica, too. But wherever these crystals grow, people know disappointingly very little about them. Still, they're awfully pretty. Hey, ever heard of a fire rainbow? Yeah, me neither. How about a circumhorizontal arc? Didn't think so, but just so you know, They're one and the same thing. At first glance, it looks like a painting, or like a rainbow-colored splash in the sky. Despite the name, they have nothing in common with either fire or rain. This phenomenon happens on rare occasions when the sun shines through a particular type of ice cloud formation. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, a specific type of ice crystals and clouds needs to be present for the surface of the Earth to bend light from the Sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that moon halos are usually white, and sun halos can be rainbow-colored. When visiting regions with high altitudes, you may be one of the lucky people to stumble upon penitentes. They're basically naturally formed ice spikes. For them to be formed, They need a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor rather than melting it into water. And that's why these blades of snow and ice start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. As cute as they may be, they can end up as tall as 15 feet. Now, what happens when small individual droplets of lava meet the wind? Pele's hair, basically. Let me explain. The word Pele comes from an ancient Hawaiian symbol for volcanoes. Whenever the wind picks up little drops of lava, it stretches them into hair-like strands, 
similar to the process of glass wire creation. These delicate strands can stretch as far as 6 feet. On rare occasions, it can rain without any clouds. But does it really? Let's look at the science behind this rare phenomenon. It's sometimes called a sun shower, just because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. Let's be clear though, there is no way rain can ever come down directly from a star. Rain clouds are at a bit of a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Add a little wind to blow the rain in your direction, and ta-da! You get sun showers. Located in Bolivia is a place called Salar de Uni. It's the largest salt flat in the world. It's also the home of half of the world's lithium, which is a crucial component for making batteries. But what else is so special about this place? Well, whenever the rain season comes, it turns this piece of flat land into a perfectly reflective mirror lake. What comes to your mind when you hear about the Blood Falls? A horror movie? <laughs> well, they are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special kind of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets the air. Hence, the reddish color of the waterfall, which also gives it its trademark name. Okay, we all know the song, but it's not really made up. There is actually such a thing called a desert rose. It's not a plant, though, but a unique form of the mineral gypsum. It develops in dry sandy places that can occasionally flood. This constant switching between a wet and dry environment lets the gypsum crystals emerge between grains of sand, trapping them and forming a rose-like shape. Ever heard of the Eye of Sahara? Scientists are still trying to figure out how it was formed. You can only see it if you fly above it, but it's basically a naturally formed dome that dates back to approximately 100 million years ago. And no, I wasn't around then. It has a rough diameter of 25 miles and consists of a bunch of concentric rings. The biggest one, or the central area, measures about 19 miles in diameter. Astronauts were some of the first people to notice it, and it's been studied ever since. In fact, even to this day, when landing in Florida, they know they're almost home when they see the Eye of Sahara. One of the most beautifully colored trees in the world is located in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's called the Rainbow Eucalyptus. It got its name because of its bark that switches colors and peels away as the tree ages. The bright green bark is the youngest, as it contains a substance called chlorophyll, usually found in leaves. It then switches to purple and then to the color red. And finally, it turns brown as it grows and loses the chlorophyll. Now, don't be tricked into thinking that's a whole forest. It's one single tree. And no, it's not some sort of optical illusion either. Let me explain. Underneath that soil, there is a complex network of roots that connects around 47,000 tree-like shapes you see above the ground. It's called the quaking aspen. Some of these trees are among the oldest and largest organisms in the world. Now, here's a good destination for all travelers, or maybe not so good after all. The most lightning-stricken area in the world, according to recent data released by NASA, is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Out of all the days in a year, 300 of them feature thunderstorms in this location. What makes this area so unique, though, that storms happen so often? Well, it's because where cool mountain air meets the warm, moist breeze and generates electricity over the lake. The Eternal Flame Falls are located in upstate New York, near the Canadian border. In this region, there is a tiny waterfall with a big secret, a spark about 8 inches tall. Turns out there's a natural gas seat that provides fuel to the flame behind the waterfall. The waterfall provides enough coverage so that it stays lit pretty much every time. Hikers do enjoy to relight it if they see that it's been blown out. This phenomenon is actually quite common, but this one gained more popularity because it is younger than most. And it looks very good in pictures, let's be honest. I've heard of yellow sand, white sand, and even black sand here or there. 
But I've never heard of green beaches until now. Papakolia, also known as Green Sand Beach, is located in Hawaii and is one of the few beaches in the world that features green sand. The unique coloring comes from olivine rock that was formed when a nearby volcano erupted. Actually, in Hawaii, all the volcanoes are nearby. Move over green sands because some of the other beaches around the world can even glow at night. And it's completely natural. The culprit? A little thing called photoplankton, or microalgae, as they're sometimes called. They're basically little plants that contain chlorophyll and need sunlight in order to live and grow. Most photoplankton kinds are able to float in the upper part of the ocean, where the sunlight can still reach them beneath the water. When the photoplankton gets agitated by the movement of waves and currents, they emit light, which looks like some glow during the night. These special microorganisms are found on beaches in a lot of places around the world, such as the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and the Everglades. At the base of a mountain located just outside of Afton, Wyoming, is a little river called the Intermittent Spring. There are only three of this kind in the whole world, but what makes this little string of water so mysterious? Well, the fact that it starts and stops every few minutes. Scientists have yet to pinpoint precisely why this happens. They speculate that it's basically just a siphon effect that happens deep within the ground that causes the river to just start and stop so often. Should you ever be interested in checking it out, be sure to do so in the late summer, as that's when the intermittent spring is most active. Do you see the irony here? You can only see the spring in the summer? Okay, I'm done. Rainbows. Yeah, they're cool with their seven colors and all. But let's face it, we're all familiar with them, so it's pretty much like your grandma's famous recipe. Sure, it's amazing, but seriously, grandma, again? Thankfully, nature always finds new ways to surprise us. From a lemon the size of a basketball popping up in your backyard to a tiny fungus sprouting on a clothespin. Actually, those are bug eggs. Gross. Anyway, nature is anything but boring. So buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. You know, some people say that pyrite is supposed to make you rich and rose quartz is all about love and a watermelon tourmaline, well, who cares? Uh, let's be honest, in general, rocks are dull, but on rare occasions, rocks can rock our world. No pun intended. Picture this. You're on the newest How About Survival reality show. It's day one in the middle of nowhere, your stomach's making some serious noise, and you spot what looks like a juicy piece of steak on the ground. Yum, but nah, it's a rock, and it looks like breaking your teeth is today's special on the menu. Your next survival task throws you into the middle of the desert, and you still haven't found any food. At some point, you spot this. Your vision is a bit blurry, but now you're convinced it's a juicy Big Mac, a huge one. You run towards it, but nope, not a burger, not a mirage. Again, just a rock. And hey, hey, leave that popcorn on the ground, thank you. Yep, when we are hungry, suddenly everything starts looking like food. But on a day-to-day -day basis, our special power is actually seeing faces everywhere. There's even a name for this psychological phenomenon, pareidolia. This quirky tendency is what makes us gaze at this jalapeno and see a T-Rex, grab this random rock and think that it's a Pablo Picasso portrait, and look at this tree and immediately see a, well, never mind. Essentially, pareidolia is your eyes playing tricks on you attributing meanings to the most random images. But this phenomenon isn't just about finding cute hidden figures in nature. Sure, spotting a heart in a feather can make us go all awww. However, pareidolia can also send shivers down your spine. Take a bell pepper, for example. On the one hand, you can chop it and find a little flamingo. Awww. But on the other hand, ah. What is that? Looks like this bell pepper has snapped. I don't judge. It's just got chopped in half, you see. If you've got a weak heart, brace yourself. Because that was just the warm-up for the more scary side of nature. Scarily ridiculous, I would say. The first time I saw this photo, it scared the crap out of me. 
If you're already thinking these are a bunch of shadow monsters from Stranger Things, I'm sorry to disappoint, it's less dramatic than that. These are just leaves. Creepy leaves. Sure, but leaves. I literally had nightmares the first time I saw this photo. My initial reaction was to picture some weird ritual with more than 10 hanging skulls. So you can imagine my surprise when I did some research and found out that these weird little skulls are, in fact, flowers. Yep, the snapdragon flower turns into this creepy thing when it dries out. Well, I guess this is just a friendly reminder not to forget to water your plants. Nobody wants one of those things in their house, right? Watch out! Our next nature anomaly is after your brains. Clearly, watching The Last of Us before bed yesterday was not a great idea because the only thing I see in this picture is a zombie's foot. It even has all five fingers and a somewhat disproportionate pinky finger. But that's just the Zellaria polymorpha, a bizarre-looking fungus. Oh, wait. Isn't that exactly how The Last of Us plot starts? Oh, my. Let's just move on. What? Is that a giant over there? I guess this hairy monster with those thin, enormous legs is ready to invade the city. Who will save us? Well, actually, anyone with a chainsaw can be a lifesaver here. No, don't call your dad just yet. The knowledge of how to cut down palm trees is also required here. Animals can be surprisingly creepy up close. You might not notice all the weird details at first glance, but if you zoom in and really pay attention... Oh, boy. Take an emu, for instance. It's got a funny face, especially when it opens its mouth. Uh, look at that. Cute, right? But trust me, emus can get kinda creepy. Seriously, don't zoom in on an emu's legs. See? I warned you. Those things look like dragon scales. How weird is that? Or maybe this emu just needs a good moisturizer, I don't know. The pink pads, the fluffy fur, those tiny nails. There's just something oddly relaxing about watching videos of people trimming cat paws. But fingers crossed the groomers don't take off too much for otherwise cat paws might end up looking like this. Damn! Is that what their paws really look like without fur? They resemble duck feet but are even more bizarre, if that's possible. Check out this image and tell me what you see. Stalactites in a cave? A bunch of fungi? Strange underwater plants, maybe? Well, time to zoom out. You were right if you guessed that it's a cow. Yeah, a cow. I would never, in a million years, think the inside of a cow's mouth could look like something out of a horror movie. But yeah, it does. Nature, as organic and spontaneous as it might seem, surprisingly has a lot to do with math. And no, I'm not talking about trying to figure out if this cherry tomato is hiding a sneaky six, or is it a nine? Anyway, by now you've probably seen pics of a nautilus half-shell being associated with the golden ratio. I'm talking about that mathematical constant that loves showing up in nature, especially in those mesmerizing spiral growth patterns. This perfect equation is likely what makes this twirly dandelion so easy on the eye. And this eggplant, oh, absolutely not. This is far from perfection. It's more like the muse behind the poop emoji. We're so used to always seeing spirals and round shapes in nature that square things seem like anomalies. Take this cloud, for instance. Sure, there's probably a smart scientific reason behind this phenomenon, something related to differences in temperature, air pressure, and all that, but I like to imagine that someone took a ruler and decided to make this cloud look perfectly straight, but ended up messing up the edges. I mean, it's a bit chaotic back there, isn't it? Yeah. It totally seems like the intern in charge of designing the sky is a bit distracted today. Someone, please buy them a coffee as we've just spotted another glitch. In this case, they should have put a piece of cloud right there. Yep, right there. Uh, another hypothesis is that a square-shaped spaceship has just invaded Earth. But I'm sure you have a better guess of what's happened here, so don't forget to share your theory in the comments. So... At the start of this video, I kind of brushed off rainbows, saying they weren't such a big deal. I mean, those classic art-shaped ones are indeed a bit overrated, but seeing a full-circle rainbow is pretty darn impressive. 
But there's one thing that's actually bugging me about this picture. In this whole rain circle scenario, where the heck is the leprechaun with the pot of gold supposed to be? Oh, there he is. Great, now I can sleep in peace. I'm sure there's been a time, at least once, when you looked up at the sky and thought, what the heck is that? Now, picture this. Someone is casually strolling with their kid, and all of a sudden, the boy points at the sky, screaming. He's terrified by a huge, gigantic, furious... tornado? No, hold on, hold on, it's just a bizarre cloud. Phew! Can't blame the kid for being scared. Admit it, you would be a bit on edge too. You don't even have to look up to find the universe's glitches. Most of the time, they're right under your nose. Time for a grocery run. So much fun, right? I'm betting we'll discover some anomalies in the fruit section. Let's check out the bananas. I think we can all agree that bananas are basically perfect. They've got that bright color and the best packaging ever. No messy hands after eating them. But I wasn't exactly expecting to come across this banana. Maybe we can snag a discount here. Three for the price of one. The manager wasn't into that deal, huh? No biggie. Let's go for this papaya instead. The manager won't even realize that we're actually getting four for the price of one. Though I have to admit, I'm a bit hesitant about eating it. Yeah, let's just leave it right there. Maybe we will get lucky in the next section. Bingo! Here's a pumpkin that looks like a swan. That's perfect, because you don't have to waste time carving it for next Halloween. Just toss on a little black tutu, some dark eyeshadow, and voila! Your pumpkin is now rocking Natalie Portman's black swan look. Oh, you think everything at this supermarket is a bit weird? No hard feelings. I'm sure this eggplant and its long... nose has scared you. Okay, I totally get it. I guess you can just start planting your own stuff at home. I mean, you can't escape anomalies completely. Check out this carrot, for example. It decided to sprout upside down like it needed a new perspective on life. But believe it or not, it's better to grow a carrot with an identity crisis than to deal with this mutant here. Pay attention to the soda can placed there to give us an idea of how big this monster is. So yeah, it's officially a mutant carrot. And don't even bother explaining how this lettuce grew into a mini Christmas tree. The good news is that you won't have to lug around a heavy pine tree during the holidays. Just slap some Christmas lights onto your lettuce anomaly, ask Alexa to play Jingle Bells, and let the festive laziness begin. Christmas reminds me of cold weather, and cold weather reminds me of winter anomalies. I mean, sure, in the spring you can find things like this bizarre flower, half pink and half white, sort of like those pizzas that go half and half when you and your friend can't agree on one flavor. Seriously, just to order the margarita already. And in the fall, you might come across this strange leaf that looks like it's been painted by some tree-hugging artist. But winter, well, no other season beats winter when we're talking about nature's quirks. I get it. Trudging through knee-deep snow every damn day makes winter a real pain in the ass. But it's only during the coldest time of the year that we get to see things like natural chess pieces, for instance. The only difference here is that you have to wear gloves to checkmate, and you're probably gonna get pissed trying to move the pieces. But hey, it's free, right? So, it's a solid gift suggestion for your monster-in-law. Nature plays tricks on us during winter, just like what went down here. Take a look at all those footprints around the lamppost. I bet these tracks are from people who ran away after coming face to face with this snake. But of course, they must have felt ridiculous afterward. I mean, a glove was all it took to protect them from any danger here. But nothing beats the tricky prank that nature decided to pull next. Imagine leaving your house in the dark and coming face to face with this huge ice ghost the size of a person. Brr. I mean, boo. I don't know about you, but I would freeze in my tracks. This house sure looks like it's haunted by an evil Elsa spirit. Let's go inside to get warmer. Yeah, you can grab some blankets from the bedroom and... Oh, damn, is that a cat? Look at the I want your soul stare. 
Seeing this eerie feline lurking in the shadows and sitting like a creepy adult is just freaking me out. I swear if it crosses its legs, I'm out of here. Check out the shadow on the wall. It's like the cat turns into a little demon after dark with that devilish pair of horns. Creepy. You know that old saying about how to protect yourself from bears? Well, I guess if you have zero chances to face bears daily, you won't know. But that's okay, I'll teach you. It's something like, if it's brown, lie down. If it's black, fight back. If it's a bear in a tree, hope that none of the branches break. Who's a good bear? You are. And you. And you. Oh, we are screwed. Let's get out of here. A bunch of bears hanging around might scare us, but as you saw, they can't bring a tree down. Some trees are tough and always find a way to survive, even if you try to stop them. Yep, they'll ignore your stop sign, not even caring how many cars are going to crash at the intersection. Hey, little dog. If I were you, I'd find another tree to pee on. This one doesn't look like it's playing around. If you take a quick look at this photo, you might initially think the stop sign is hanging on the tree. Or perhaps you're wondering if the oddity in this pic is that the tree trunk is made of aluminum. That would be interesting, but that's not the case. Take a closer look behind the sign. Once again, we've got an empowered tree, and nothing can stop it. Yep. This tree is actually growing inside the sign. This pic should totally be on the cover of a motivational book, no joke. The thing is, nature will always find its way, even if it means taking possession of some of our stuff. Like these muscles that probably couldn't stand walking barefoot anymore, so they took over this shoe. I mean, really took over. Or this moss-covered Furby that turned every 90s kid's biggest nightmare into reality. At this point, you already know that if nature wants it, nature gets it. So please, tell your dog to call off its hunger strike as soon as possible, because this hairy black mold is taking over all its favorite snacks. Yep, that totally looks like a bush. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of bush, you dirty mind. I was thinking about the black mondo grass. Look it up. But hey, I can't blame you for getting a little carried away with the whole bush situation. Nature's got this cheeky side, letting our imaginations run wild, you know. And some contours seem to have come straight out of a green light district. Picture this. You're on a peaceful garden stroll and bam. A perfectly rounded and voluptuous, hmm, bulge. Actually, I was going for another B word, but I'm sure you get it. You don't need to kick the kids out of the room just yet. I mean, well, maybe you should because I have no clue what the heck is going on here. Ah, phew, these are just berries. Actually, we should call them booberies, because they even got little berryolas. I could keep going with other puns, but just got attacked by boobies. What's your all-time favorite horror movie? Let me guess. The Blair Witch Project is in your top five. No? Okay, but it got to be at least in your top ten. There's something extra terrifying about seeing that dark forest filmed on handheld cameras. And you don't need a witch's legend for a forest to get even scarier. After all, nature itself has certain anomalies hidden in the jungle that make everything much more eerie. Take this skeleton face, for instance. This tree trunk looks like it is chowing down on the fence attempting to reclaim its forest territory. Picture this. You set up camp in the White Mountains in Arizona. You're exploring the woods, it's getting dark, and you come across this massive fallen tree. Jeez, it looks like a forest monster with those super strong roots resembling multiple arms. I mean, not strong enough, apparently. This piece of wood looks like it's been possessed by a spooky aura with that strange, white, smoky thing. In reality, it's just a spider web trapping that leaf over there. I said just a spider web. But thinking about it, I guess that's even more terrifying. I mean, spiders are scary. Take a look at this creepy one. It's creating its own portal to another dimension. Just wait and see. This old tree burl has all these wavy patterns that seem to come straight out of a Van Gogh painting. It's impressive and even beautiful at first sight, but it becomes super strange if you start seeing a bunch of little spooky faces in that pattern. 
Here's one face, here's another one, and here's one more. Do you know what trypophobia is? It's when people have an aversion or fear of small holes when they're all close together. One theory suggests that we can develop this fear because our brains link groups of holes with dangerous things, like the eyes of a tarantula, for example. That's why looking at this twisted beehive can be seriously disturbing, making some folks feel nauseous and even giving them headaches. And that darker part down there is giving me the creeps. Ugh. If you also felt uneasy, then let me introduce you to this little guy. Hey, don't be fooled by his red mohawk and googly eyes. This dude is the ultimate villain for those with trypophobia. During summer, the acorn woodpecker drills hundreds, even thousands of holes in a tree to stash acorns for their winter feast. Yeah, this birdie is clever. After all, nobody would dare to steal its food after getting close to this weird tree. It's amazing how nature has its own rules, and you don't need to be a biologist to know some of them. Let me give you an example. Trees. One thing we all know since we were little kids is that trees grow upwards, right? Right. But this rule isn't always that obvious, at least not for this rebellious fig tree here, which apparently skipped the manners classes 101. Here's another obvious nature rule that we all know, even if we're not plant experts. Palm trees usually have a straight trunk or a slightly bent one. But, well, it's not quite like that. They can also have a roller coaster trunk. At least this way, the coconuts will have a funny ride when they fall. When we learn how to draw trees at school, we never include the roots, but we can imagine what they look like. You know, roots are like this underground tapestry, all tangled up and going everywhere. Yeah, we can picture that whole messy underground scenario, and that definitely doesn't look like this freaky situation. Square roots on the sidewalk, seriously. That ended up looking just like that old 3D pipe screensaver. You know, the way we used to trip back in the 90s. Camouflage is like nature's way of helping creatures sneak around, making them blend in with their surroundings. Long story short, it is a defense mechanism, and chameleons are the OGs in this hide-and-seek game. But the next images show that fruits and veggies can also play camouflage themselves, even though no one really knows what their end game is. Take this pear, for example, and it's practically winking at you, tempting you to take a big bite. But hold up, slice it up and toss it in the fryer because this is actually a freaking potato. Could this be some kind of new green cherry? Hmm, take a closer look. Hey, Guinness Book, you better pay attention here because we might have not one but two winners for the smallest apples in the world. As if anyone cared about this record, but whatever. And this lemon? Well, there's no camouflage tricks here. It's just a bizarre lemon living its best life. Arms wide open to the air, ready to be hugged. I mean, squeezed. Ready to be squeezed. After that pointless camouflage lecture, let's dive into a leaf lesson. Don't nod off just yet, all right? We're not discussing heart-shaped leaves or those other basic ones. We're talking anomalies. So, say hello to this skeleton leaf. The green part just pulled a disappearing act. Yep, totally ghosted, just like that Tinder match who ignored all your haze. In both cases, it's just unbelievable. Now, let's talk about a drama queen leaf. It's like those people you have to walk around on eggshells because you need to do literally everything to avoid confrontation. So, I'm pretty sure you understand how desperate this pepper is. It's just trying to get away when deep down it wants to scream, Leave me alone! So bad. Love is like Wi-Fi. It has the power to connect us anywhere. I know this sounds like something a dime a dozen coach would say, but love is cheesy and addicting. At some point, you start to look completely foolish seeing love in every little thing on a daily basis. Want to test if you're feeling that way? Great. So now it's time for the quiz, how in love are you? It's kind of like a psychological test, but, you know, without any actual psychological theory behind it. Check out these trees and tell me, what comes to your mind? To me, they are just bizarre. 
I can't wrap my head around why that pine tree decided to grow horizontally around the palm tree. But if you're in love, suddenly the whole scene transforms. And these trees remain tangled forever, in a bond stronger than any engagement ring. And what about these two ducks just doing their thing? If you're not in love, well, they are just two ducks. And there's nothing extraordinary going on here besides some occasional quack. But for all you lovebirds out there, these two ducks transform into a bride and groom. Congratulations, I guess. Ha! Huh. Now here's the ultimate test. Check out this photo. Are these just two regular trees, or are they going at it like a couple of love-struck teenagers? As I said, this is the ultimate test, because even I'm thinking, guys, get a room. I mean, trees, get a forest. If you manage to spot plants hugging each other, ducks dressed as a bride and groom, and trees making out, I've got the final results of our quiz. And I have to tell you, my friend, you are madly in love. If you didn't catch any of this stuff, well, I hope you enjoyed the last nature anomalies from our list. So, hey, drop your result in the comments, and don't forget to share this video with your soulmate. Hey, you're running through a vast field at night, as if something is chasing you right now. The light of the full moon brightens your path, and you see a circle of light around it. You run on, looking for a safe shelter. It's not about werewolves, who are said to appear when the moon is full. Soon, this place will be the epicenter of a major storm. This very circle around the moon is called a halo, and ice crystals cause it in the sky. When the moon is full, it reflects a lot of sunlight. These rays then pass to the Earth's surface, but they curve their trajectory and split as they pass through hexagonal ice crystals. As a result, we have a halo of different colors, almost like a rainbow. The inner edge of the halo is red, and the outer edge is blue. It looks beautiful, but the presence of ice in the clouds means this ice will soon turn into water and begin to fall to the ground. And this rain will be so heavy that you'd better find a shelter beforehand. If the weather is quite warm and the clouds are closer to the ground, you might see a similar phenomenon, a corona. It's much smaller than a halo, but much more colorful. The bluish-white disc on the inside turns brownish-red on the outside. Unlike halo, the corona is made of water droplets. The smaller these drops are, the larger the corona will be. If the water droplets are large, the corona will look like a bright spot the size of the moon itself. Both the corona and halo might also occur during the day when the sun is shining. But be sure to wear sunglasses before just glancing at it, because it's very bright and really bad for your eyes. As soon as you find a shelter, it starts raining heavily. Whoa, what is that? Are you being photographed? No, the flash you just saw is lightning. Bam! Thunder is so strong, the windows in the house start to shake. Here's a tip on how to tell if you're far away from the epicenter of a thunderstorm. When you see lightning, start counting. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3, and so on. When you hear the thunder, stop counting. Now, you have to divide that number by 5. If you can count to 5, it means the epicenter of the thunderstorm is 1 mile away. If you didn't find a shelter before the thunderstorm started and it caught you in the open, leave the high ground immediately. Any mountain or hill is a high-risk area. Don't even think about hiding under a tree. Tall objects are the first target for lightning. Power poles are also at risk. If a thunderstorm catches you riding a bike, drop it immediately and run away. Same if you were riding in a convertible, golf cart, or motorcycle. If a thunderstorm started while you were in an open field, the tallest object here is you. Get down and try to cover yourself somehow. If you're not alone, try to keep your distance from each other. Whew! Now, let's admire the beautiful sunrise. It looks like someone spilled red paint on the sky. This beautiful view means it's about to start raining. You can see a red sky at sunrise because the high-pressure zone has just passed you by and is now followed by a low-pressure zone with high water content in the air. So take an umbrella with you or go back to a warm bed and stay indoors. There's an old saying to keep it all straight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Sometimes you can even predict rain by smelling it. It's all about ozone molecules. Storm currents bring ozone down from the upper atmosphere. And when the storm is about to start, you can smell a sense of cleanliness. It's like you just washed the floor with clean water. Your sense of smell gets more sensitive before it starts to rain. It's not because of your nose, but because of the more humid air. 
Flowers spray their scent, and the water molecules stick to it, spreading it much better. That's why the same flowers smell different when you smell them outside or in a closed, humid greenhouse. Plants can also help you predict changes in weather. If you touch the grass in the morning and it's wet, it means it's going to be a clear day. That morning water on the grass is dew. It appears at the coldest time of night. Clear skies allow the earth to cool a bit, and the water vapor molecules in the air turn into a liquid that settles on various surfaces. Take a closer look at the leaves on the trees. Sometimes they can be upside down. For example, maple leaves respond well to increased humidity before the rain. Their stems become very soft, and the wind can turn them upside down. But the best indicator is pine cones. The seeds are inside the cone, just under its scales. The pine needs to keep them as dry as possible so that the wind can carry the seeds far away and new trees can emerge from them. So when the pine senses rain approaching, it gives the order to close the cones. Then the scales close, protecting the seeds from the water. And instead of boring weather forecast hosts, you can just follow the animals and insects. Have you heard the crickets chirp? That will be your thermometer for today. Set the timer for 15 seconds and count how many times crickets chirp. Add 37 to that number and you get the outdoor temperature value in Fahrenheit degrees. All because air temperature directly affects crickets' metabolism. It can chirp slower and faster depending on how warm it is. So throw away your thermometer and get yourself a little friend. Now, if you don't like insects, look up into the sky for birds. If they're flying high, it'll be a clear and sunny day. But before it rains, air pressure prevents birds from flying high. You may see them flying in flocks very low, most likely looking for shelter. So even if the sky is clear, air pressure tells you that rain is coming. If you live near a river or lake, you can hear toads singing, although you can't quite make out the lyrics because it's in toad. They are especially loud before it rains hard. Toads, in general, love wet weather, so they just get excited. Rain is also the best time for females to lay eggs, so they scream loudly in search of a guy to wed. Ow! A mosquito has just bitten you. If mosquitoes are being especially aggressive, you better find a shelter fast. The insects are just trying to eat more before they have to starve during the storm. Also, the warm, humid air makes us sweat more, and we become even more attractive to mosquitoes. Insects also gather in swarms before a thunderstorm. They love the moisture in the air and start circling in a dance. But then they vanish into thin air. It means you have one hour left before heavy rain starts. To predict the weather for the next day, you need to watch the bees. If it rains tomorrow, the bees work overtime. They're pollinating flowers actively because they know they won't be able to leave the hive the next day because of the rain. Squirrels can predict the weather for the whole season. They usually stock up on food for the cold times. And if they start doing it early, it's going to be a tough winter. You can see squirrels running around looking for acorns. They hide them in the ground and run to find the next one. The squirrels often forget where they hid the food. These acorns turn into little sprouts, so we have many new trees, all thanks to squirrels. Animals can also predict disasters like earthquakes. Scientists once did a study in an area with frequent earthquakes in Europe. They put trackers on cows, dogs, and sheep. About 18,000 earthquakes occurred there during that time. Most of them were insignificant, but there were also 12 with a magnitude of 4 on the Richter scale. And each time before the earthquakes, researchers recorded strange animal behavior. It was as if they were trying to escape from the earthquake zone. Scientists believe animals can sense the ionization of the air before a disaster with their fur. Their good sense of smell also allows them to smell gas. It comes from moving deep underground and then trying to find its way out through small cracks in the surface. The first records of such animal behavior date back to ancient Greece. Cats, rats, snakes, and centipedes left their homes and fled to safety days before a major earthquake hit Greece. Some fish can predict the weather in the area. If sharks hang out near the shore, they're not necessarily looking for food. They may be hiding from a big storm at sea. The worst sign on the coastline is when all the water starts to go back abruptly. You can see the entire shoreline and even the fish and coral that are left on the land. Run away immediately, because soon a huge tsunami wave will come here and wash everything away. 
Something interesting has recently happened in South Dakota. It was all over the internet, so perhaps you already know about it. In July of 2022, the sky in this state suddenly turned green. So what happened there? Was it caused by a human or by nature? Let's find out. Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Shortly after a heavy storm, the sky over South Dakota in the U.S. was still overcast. Locals finally went outside and saw that the sky had an intense dark green hue, and they'd never seen anything like that before. People said that it looked like something straight up from science fiction or even a horror movie. Unsurprisingly, South Dakotans immediately started spreading the news all over social media. People shared their beautiful, yet very eerie, pictures on Twitter. They showed the sky over the city of Sioux Falls and a few other towns. Even though it may look like something supernatural, in reality, this is not a terrifying phenomenon at all. It's a simple play of the light and the atmosphere. Something like this happens quite rarely and usually means that really bad weather is approaching. And that's also true to what happened in South Dakota. Just before people started sharing photos, a thunderstorm swept through the town of Sioux Falls. This was confirmed by the U.S. Weather Service. This hurricane was terrible. The wind speed was about 100 miles per hour. According to the Buford Scale on wind speeds, this is the fastest and most destructive storm. There are only 12 numbers on this scale, and the maximum wind strength starts at 73 miles per hour. But why isn't this all over the news then? Well, because it's kind of a usual thing for the residents. Thunderstorms occur very often in the United States, especially in the warmer months. And one out of 10 such thunderstorms can become something serious, like a tornado. This one wasn't an exception. It was the so-called Derreco storm. Derreco is very widespread and long-lived. It's actually a combination of a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms and downpours. People often say that a Derreco is as strong as a tornado. Still, there's a difference between them. A tornado is a vortex, a rotating column of air. It's usually about 500 feet in diameter although sometimes its width can reach up to 2.5 miles. I don't envy those who would stumble upon that. But the main point is that they rotate. The wind moves very fast in a circle, near some invisible center. A Derreco is a strong thunderstorm, or a system of strong thunderstorms with straight line winds. In other words, it doesn't spin. Instead, the Derreco chooses a point somewhere and simply runs to it, like a very motivated marathon runner. If we compare a Derreco to an ordinary tornado, the latter has six levels of strength, from 40 to 380 miles per hour. So a Derreco is kind of like a small, average level one to two tornado. Usually its speed is within the range of 73 to 113 miles per hour. And in both cases, they can be accompanied by severe thunderstorms, lightning, and rain. But still, these are different things. A storm becomes a Derreco if the damage trail left by it exceeds 240 miles, and if the wind speed is at least 58 miles per hour. It's quite difficult to predict. It can form even on a clear day when meteorologists don't even anticipate any storms. And then, the winds appear suddenly. It's so surprising that they may even feel explosive. But the National Weather Service tries to warn people at least half an hour or an hour before this happens, so that residents have time to prepare and hide. It wasn't any different this time. The storm swept through almost all of South Dakota, as well as the states of Minnesota and Iowa. The consequences were quite serious. More than 30,000 people were left without electricity. Fortunately, people were fine. That's because the locals are pretty used to Derecos. However, the green sky is something different. It became a very unusual sight for the locals. Everyone was wondering why it happened. Was it a bad sign or a normal weather phenomenon? Well, to be honest, 
scientists don't have an exact explanation. But although there are only assumptions, they sound pretty convincing. A green sky is a very rare phenomenon. Most scientists think that this happens when a powerful storm approaches the area before sunset or sunrise. Then the sky will turn green in this area. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns, who once faced a similar event himself, suggests that the green sky appeared because of the huge hail before the storm. First, let's talk about why the sky looks blue, or any other shade, depending on its mood. In short, the sun simultaneously carries all the rays of the color spectrum. It may seem white to us in total, but it actually has all the colors at the same time. However, these color waves all have different lengths. For example, blue rays are shorter than the other ones. They jump away from the air molecules better than the red waves, so they reach us faster. Because of this, on a regular clear day, the sky seems blue. At the same time, red and orange color waves are very long and move slower, so they're usually left behind. But when the sun goes below the horizon or rises, the rays' directions change, and these waves reach us better. It all means that even if the sunrises and sunsets seem red and orange to us, in fact, there are still blue and green waves among them but they have to bounce off something to reach us faster and become stronger than the red rays. Have you guessed what I'm getting at? This is where the water comes into play. Clouds are made up of water droplets. When they become large enough, but don't fall yet, for example, due to strong winds, they affect how the light behaves in the sky. Large, heavy storms mostly consist of water and hail and water reflects blue and green rays best of all. That's exactly the reason why the water in rivers and lakes seems bluish green to us, although in reality, it's transparent. And yeah, algae matter too. So, there are a couple of key factors why the sky may turn green. First off, the sun should be at the horizon level. Another factor is that while the storm clouds are approaching, they shouldn't cover the sky completely. There still must be a little room for the sun rays. Then, barely noticeable blue rays jump up to storm clouds. They're repelled by water droplets and hail. Mixing with the red sunset, they turn into a bright green light. And this green light is spreading all over the sky. That's why in most of these cases, when the sky turns green, people can only see it in the evenings. Yeah, it can also happen in the middle of the day. But since the conditions are already quite specific, seeing something like that during the day is even rarer. Still, if you see a green sky, you don't need to panic. It doesn't necessarily mean that a terrible storm is approaching. The chances are high though, but still, it's not a rule. It can be just heavy rain or a heavy hail. In other words, if you see a green sky, then you'd better hide and hide your car. However, if you were lucky enough to see the stunning sky from the comfort of your own home, it's indeed very exciting. If you get a glimpse of something like that, just know that you had a chance to experience something very rare and special. Some people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. Ah, beautiful. You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. 
Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into the super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes. Maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour. So watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous. But the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam, or boom! 
<laughs> you get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. I'll 